So once again, thank you very much for coming by to, uh, to listen to this talk. Um, let's see, there's a blizzard outside. I think everybody uh, braved the elements to be here. My name is Gun Sir. I, uh, am, uh, I'm an associate professor at Cornell University, and I want to talk to you about Hyperdex. It's a second generation NoSQL data store. So in particular, I want to tell you a little bit about this new system that we built, what makes it interesting, what makes it exciting. So all of you know that uh, sort of the standard approach to data management is you take a, what's called a relational database management system, something like Oracle, something like MySQL. You put your data in it, and then you end up sending queries to it, and it goes and, thinks, and does some query optimization, and it trickles out your data back to you. So that's fine and, and okay, except everybody who's ever man managed a really big RDBMS installation knows that it's very, very difficult to make a, a, such, a, such an installation perform well and scale up. Why? Because fundamentally these systems are centralized systems. They are not really designed for vertical scalability or horizontal scalability. So, oof, not this. So what happened? Well, what happened is about 10 years ago, a new brand of systems emerged. These are called NoSQL databases, and they are fundamentally different from your traditional RDBMS system. They're very, very different, uh, differently architected, completely different uh, internal organization uh, in how they manage data. And it's that particular architecture, it's their fundamental nature that makes them completely unsuited for three things. One is efficient search. Two is consistency, being able to give you the data that you, you, you want, the latest data that you just put into the system. And three is fault tolerance. These systems are terrible at dealing with faults. I want to tell you a little bit about, uh, about why these systems fail the way they do. So, but before I do that, let me tell you how they work, okay? So this is the big difference from RDBMS to NoSQL. If you have an RDBMS system, if you have an Oracle installation, you have one machine, one software, a team of uh, DBAs, database administrators, trying to make that system perform okay. Right? That's a very expensive proposition. The nice thing about NoSQL is it's really easy to scale, and this is how it kind of works. You end up buying a whole bunch of servers like this one, like this set up here, and you organize them in your data center, and you take your data, and uh, you do what's called sharding. You take a data item like this one, it's got a key, let's say a user ID for D-Octar, right? So I take that D-O-K-T-A-R, I hash it, I come up with some value. And so that particular value, let's say it's 37, it ends up being right there, right? On the, so this is, a, this is a circle from zero to 100. I hashed Denise's user ID, I end up with some value. And so that value then determines where I place his data. Okay? So in this case, I put it on the server that's next to it or closest to it in this virtual circle that I created. And so when I need Dennis's data, I just need to go to this device and retrieve it. So, so far, so awesome. This is pretty, pretty darn good. It's incredibly efficient and it scales really well, right? If I have a lot of data, my, my system is a huge success overnight. I will put down more and more and more servers and I'll scale. So this is what's so attractive about NoSQL. Where it fails, is if I want to actually do a query of the kind where I say, give me all the octars of the world. Okay, so I'm not doing a query by his user ID, I'm doing a query by his last name. And if I'm doing a query by his last name, then suddenly that item could be anywhere in my cluster, right? By doing that hashing thing, uh, by doing that consistent hashing onto that node, I ended up removing all the locality that there could have been in this data set. So then his Oktar is over here, but you know, his brother or whatever, like Jimbo Oktar, could be over there. And now somehow I need to get my queries all the way to every single host in order to be able to recall uh, that data. This is why it's really a, a hard task to get your data back from a secondary attribute search on Mongo. Right? Those searches are incredibly inefficient. The second problem has to do with consistency. So, so here's the deal. So these people tell you, well, okay, um, if you want to uh, you know, just put your data into our system and we'll, we'll do a best effort job of trying to give you back the uh, whatever data we have, but they cannot guarantee for you that you will always see the latest data item. Why? Well, for the obvious following reason. 
So you could have two different clients. This is client one and that's client two. And they could have different views of the membership of the cluster. This guy happens to think that this host and that host are dead. And that guy thinks this host and this host are dead. And so when they have a, they have a key that ends up falling right there, this guy is going to want to put it on that host. And this guy is going to want to put it on that host. So that's a bizarre situation. And even if you try to do what's are called quorums and so forth, there is no guarantee that the quorums will have overlap because these, the, these clients actually disagree on who's a member of, the, of our data center. So, so what these guys end up being able to promise you at, the, at their best is called eventual consistency. Okay? So they don't, they're unable to give you uh, what, uh, uh, what you really want, which is some kind of a strong consistency guarantee. If you want to be able to write uh, proper straight line code, you typically want to be able to say write and then read and when you do the read, you expect to see the latest thing you wrote, right? If you are unable to do that, well, then it's going to be a very difficult life, right? I ended up updating then as a salary field. I read it, and I'm not seeing my own updates. That's a pretty strange way of writing code. I don't know that most people can actually handle this. So finally, the third problem is uh, these guys actually want to make your writes go fast. So what they do is they, they tell you, okay, just write. And then in the background, we're going to propagate your writes to other replicas. So this is a fine idea, it's okay. Uh, but what it means is if there's a, a failure at the server, you can actually lose data. And uh, we were just talking about how Mongo lost, uh, you guys lost some data to Mongo. Everybody who's actually used Mongo uh, in, a, in, a, in a real environment has some battle story involving data loss in Mongo. This is the reason why, because they're doing weird things in the background, and there's a window of opportunity where they could lose data. So I want to tell you about this new system that we built. It's, uh, it started out as an academic project. It's now turned into a, uh, a, an actual commercial offering. It's a system called Hyperdex. And at its core, there are three cool technical ideas, and hopefully I'll be able to talk about all of them. Uh, well, I want to just give you sort of a basic intuition as to how these three ideas work. Um, so the main idea is hyperspace hashing. The second one is value-dependent chaining. And the third one is this, just want to give you a sense of how we achieve asset transactions. So what's so special about this system? Well, it does what most people thought was impossible, which is it's a high-performance, <coughs> consistent, available, partition-tolerant data store. Okay, so what does that mean? How many people here have heard of the CAP theorem? Ah, okay. So, a fair number of people have heard of it. For those of you who have not heard of the CAP theorem, so in, the, in Silicon Valley, this is something that everybody knows somehow. And uh, the CAP theorem goes as follows. It's, it's a very simple, very, very sort of a sexy, very, very sort of catchy phrase, okay? The phrase is consistency, availability, partition tolerance, pick at most two, okay? So, your standard developer in the valley has been told that uh, he or she can have at most two of these three incredibly desirable things. And so when we came up and we said, look, we have a data store and it's consistent and it's available and it's partition tolerant, uh, we got a lot of pushback. And people were like, no, that, can, that is impossible, technically impossible. You must be selling us uh, something that, that just cannot exist. So it took a, a bunch of uh, sort of uh, finesse and sort of uh, you know, consistent arguing to try to convince them that indeed you can have all three of these things in the same package. And uh, by now, we're not the only ones in this space who have these features. Uh, there is at least Foundation DB, and there is another system called Spanner from Google. So those, the existence of three systems now, as I think, put in the final nail in the coffin of CAP. So I'm not saying that the CAP theorem is wrong, okay? Um, in fact, what I'm going to do is first I'll tell you how the, our system works, and I'll go back and I'll try to relate it to the CAP theorem and why it's, it's actually possible to do these things without actually violating what the theorem says. It turns out that the theorem ends up saying one thing, and what people take away from it is different, and it's often uh, incorrect. All right, so consistent available partition tolerance, it's scalable, it's got a rich API, blah, blah, blah. It's kind of cool. Okay, so let me tell you how it works behind the covers. I, you know, I'm an academic, I like to, to see how things work. I want to give you the intuition for why it works well. I want to show you just how well it works. And, um, and then I'm going to relate it back to CAP and, and, and sum up. So the core idea behind Hyperdex is a 
drastically different way of actually organizing the data. So I told you about how NoSQL systems typically map your data into some kind of a ring, and uh, it ends up using something called consistent hashing to retrieve the data items. Well, in Hyperdex, we do something completely different. And uh, so I want to illustrate it with a very simple database example where we're keeping track of uh, Rolodexes. Okay, so Kartotex, I think, is the Turkish word, right? So it's uh, no, just uh, people's names, their first names, last names, and, and phone numbers. So the way we would organize this data in Hyperdex is we sort of virtually think about a... Uh, whoop, yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you so much. So we virtually create, like in our minds, we create a three-dimensional space. It's a multi-dimensional space. In this case, I have only three attributes, so I'm going to create a three-dimensional space. And, uh, and so suppose I have somebody like Neil Armstrong. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hash Neil's first name. I'm going to hash his last name. And uh, I'm going to take his phone number. I don't know, you know, the hash of a phone number is probably the, the number itself. So, so I've got these three things. And uh, this defines a coordinate for this data item, right? So Neil is like some number like 55. This Armstrong, I don't know, 82. So 55, 82, comma, 607, 655510024. That's my data point for Neil Armstrong. At the moment, I haven't done any assignment to hosts or anything. I'm just keeping track of these things in my mind, OK? So when I have, so that's Neil Armstrong. Well, if I have Lance Armstrong, where's Lance? So Lance Armstrong has a different different axes, different uh, intercept on the x-axis. He has a different name. So the hash of Lance is different, but his last name is the same. So he's going to have the same y-axis, and his phone number is different. It's down here someplace. Uh, this is Neil Diamond. So Neil is going to have the same x-axis, different y-axis. Okay? So all of these data items end up having a coordinate. So far, so OK, I hope. So the next thing we do is we tessellate the space. Tessellate is just a fancy word for just cut it up into cubes. So these are, in, in, in the general case, they're hypercubes, but in this case, they're just three-dimensional. Like, I think of them as sugar cubes, right? They're just like a bunch of cubes stacked on top of each other, and every cube is assigned to a server. So now, uh, Mr., uh, what is it, Neil Armstrong over here, his data is going to reside on that host. And uh, Mr. whatever it is, Lance Armstrong, his data is going to reside on this host. Okay. This is the critical idea. Now, what does this give us? This is a very different way of organizing our data center, very, very different from the stupid ring, the one-dimensional ring. Why? Well, because it actually retains some locality. If you come by and say, give me everybody whose first name is Neil, I don't have to go and ask every single host inside my data center. I, could, I need only ask, I know that everybody who's, whose first name is Neil has an x-axis that's this yellow, yellow plane over here. So I need only ask those uh, servers whose cubes intersect this plane. If somebody wants to just those four, not all eight. If somebody wants to find all the Armstrongs, well, all the Armstrongs are on this gray plane. So I don't need to ask everybody on the, on the back side. I only need to ask these four guys over here. If somebody wants to find Neil Armstrongs, I need only ask everybody who's at the intersection of these two planes. So that's just this line segment, and I need only ask two hosts, not everybody. And if even better, somebody wants to ask for Neil Diamond, what is it, Neil Armstrong in the 607 area code, that's a line segment. I can resolve that search very efficiently just by asking the one server that holds that particular line segment. Is everybody with me on this? Great. OK, so this is the core idea. It's called hyperspace hashing, and it's an alternative to consistent hashing. And this, I think, is the first sort of the organizing principle, the big difference that makes us different from, uh, from, uh, from the people who came before me. So, uh, so now there might be, so those of you who have a strong database background might think, hey, wait a minute, um, that sounds okay, but my data is typically very, very highly dimensional, right? I have like, I don't know, 20, 30, maybe 40 attributes, in which case uh, I would have to deal with a 40-dimensional space, right? A 40-dimensional space is going to be kind of unwield, uh, you know, unwieldy, it's going to be really, really big. But um, to compensate for that, what we do is we create subspaces. So for example, we will typically take 
a data item with D attributes, and we'll have a key subspace where the key subspace works essentially exactly like the ring that we saw before. So if Dennis wants to get the Dennis object under his primary key, D octar, well, then I'll just be able to fetch that efficiently. Um, this might be the first name, last name, you know, phone number. This might be gender and age, and these might be other. So if there's a query that says, find me everybody who's between the ages of 30 and 40 who's female, well, okay, that's going to go into that subspace. Uh, find me everybody whose last name is blah and phone number is blah, it's going to go to that subspace. So if uh, you want to think of this in database terms, traditional database terms, these correspond to materialized views. Uh, but, you know, I kind of think of them as just different subspaces. So what then is this whole idea? Um, well, it's pretty important to, to sort of talk about what it's not. What I showed you is not an index. It is not a B tree. Right? The traditional database person would come up here and say, oh, we use a B tree. I'm not suggesting that we build a B tree. There is no auxiliary data structure. There's nothing in this picture in addition to the data itself, okay? So the data is going to go to a particular host, but we're not going to have a secondary copy of the data that's going to that host. The moment we start building indices, like traditional database systems, we have two different places that we have to worry about, the data itself and then the index. It's going to be really difficult to actually keep them in sync. So what I'm showing you does not involve an index, and I don't need to worry about keeping this in sync with this. And therefore, it's going to be easy for us to get consistency if I'm careful about the protocol by which I update these objects. So, so that's sort of the first, first part of the picture. Uh, the next thing I want to talk to you about is how we actually put these, these uh, data items into the system and how we sort of manipulate them. And it's actually a fairly straightforward uh, um, uh, protocol. It's uh, based on chain replication. And uh, so before I talk about it, let me just try to motivate what's going on. Yeah. Shall we ask questions now? Or yeah, yeah, of course. No, ask, ask along, yes. Okay, the question is, uh, do we need to create the subspaces at first uh, when designing the database? Yeah. Uh, yes, very much so. So, uh, so well, okay, so that's a good question. Um, as, as, as somebody who's actually installing this, you should have some idea about where the queries are going to come from, right? How the queries are going to be structured. And you should indeed, you do need to specify a schema, and you do need to, or you need to specify a schema for your data, and uh, you need to have some idea of how to partition it into subspaces. But we support dynamic repartition. So if you find that you've deployed it and you want to change it, no problem, you can change it at any time. And uh, what I'm not talking about today, but uh, we actually have implemented, is also document store functionality. So you can start out just with documents and you store JSON objects and you have no schema whatsoever. And as you decide, okay, well now I understand that most of my objects or all of my objects have author fields or whatever, then you can actually break those out and have, it's exactly like materialized views. Typically what people do in databases, regular traditional databases, is they start out with some very simple schema and they, they add materialized views onto, on top of it. It works exactly the same. Okay, yes. From a mathematical point of view, what you described sounds like manifolds. Yes. Uh, and I wonder how, if, if that would be an operational nightmare if we want to change our schema? No, it's not. Um, let me talk to you about how we do all of the updates in this space. Um, and uh, and uh, now I think it's going to become obvious that it's actually fairly straightforward to change the schema. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so let me tell you about um, how, we actually, um, how we actually put the objects into this, uh, this data center and how we modify them. So what did I do? So I ended up going away from the traditional NoSQL organizational principles. Now we are in some different land where we're doing this hyperspace hashing thing. And in hyperspace hashing, the location of an object changes as the object changes itself, right? If then is, uh, you know, if he grows up by one year, if his age changes, the Dennis object might have to move from this location to that location. So how do we do this, right? So the simple thing you might want to do is you delete the object and you insert it. That's not going to work so well because there's going to be a t time period where it's been deleted and then reinserted. And a search at that point will not actually re recall the, the object that you want. So we need some kind of a protocol by which we can uh, sort of 
get the object into the location we want it to be. And we also need some way of dealing with faults, right? So, so far, I didn't tell you how we replicate objects. So I don't want to be in some kind of a, you know, a hell hole where I'm doing the exact same thing that Mongo is doing. I don't want to just sort of spray my writes. You know, I'm going to write to the three of you at the same time. You know, this, so sorry, let me step back. What Mongo does is I write to one of you, and then you push it out to the two of them, but at no time whatsoever do we know exactly who's got the most up-to-date values, because somebody else could have written to him, and he's writing to the two of you at the same time, and it's a big mess. That's why when Mongo goes down and comes back up, you never know what to do. So let me tell you what we do. And uh, what we're doing is uh, actually based on chain replication. Chain replication is a protocol that's also known as um, the Norwegian Army Protocol. How many people have actually served in the Army here? Anyone? Is, am I the only one? <laughs> what? <laughs> Tell me this is not true. <laughs> All right. Well, those of you who've actually served in the Army, you know how it, for one, okay, so I've served in an army unit with, uh, where 60% of the people had doctorates. We were all PhDs, essentially. But the moment you line up, your IQ drops to like 80 or so, okay? So uh, we were acting like a complete bunch of retarded people. But you have to make sure that everybody's got the same message, okay? So in the army, what they do is you end up repeating what the guy to your left said. So you say, wah, 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 and then the next guy says, wah, 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 and so forth. It's going to be the same idea. But let me, let me try and illustrate this. So suppose this is my data center, I have a key subspace, let's say I have a two-dimensional subspace, first name, last name. Let's suppose I have another two-dimensional subspace here, it doesn't matter, age and, um, age and gender. So suppose I want to insert something here, uh, this is a put operation with a key, an A1, B1. So A1, B1 means that our object is going to be on this purple node. And uh, C1, D1, it means it's going to be over here. So here's what we do. We need to get three copies of our object into these three servers. What we don't do is we write what's, what's called spray and pray. We do not just willy-nilly issue writes to these three guys at the same time. What we do instead is we send a write to what we call the role leader. This is like, uh, you know, uh, whatever it is, manga and I think this is the Turkish phrase, right? This is the guy at the head of, a, of, a, of an army unit. And then he sends it to the guy to his right, and he sends it to this guy. When this guy says, I got it, then it's committed here, then committed here, then committed there. Okay? So a write is considered complete only once it's gone all the way to the end and gone back up. Now, when it's time to change the object, we have to be a little careful. So suppose this object changes, and I have to instead move it from the blue server to the green server. Okay? So I cannot just delete it and insert it, like I could, but then there would be a problem because the object disappears for a, a, you know, a tiny fraction of a second. What instead we do is we create a new uh, chain where the chain goes to the first guy in here, then to the old location, then to the new location, and then goes all the way through. So, uh, so what this means is now is uh, as the changes are being propagated, it goes this new guy, uh, the old guy, then the new guy, and then this guy. When he says, I got it, this guy says, okay, I will commit, and this guy says, okay, I am now ready to delete. So this ensures that there is an atomic handover, that the object never disappears from the system when it's changing values. And uh, uh, there's a little version number in every object, so that there is a time period when the two versions of the object are, are in the system, but that's not a big deal, because if somebody does a search and discovers that the same object exists on two servers, we know exactly which one is the old one and must be discarded, and which one is the new one. So this is a pretty nice property. What it really means is every time you do a get, you are guaranteed to see the result of the latest put. It's just an ironclad, strong consistency guarantee. And, uh, and once an object has moved to a new location, if it changes again, I don't have to go to, to the old guys. There's nothing. So in, in many other databases, there are what's called tombstones. Uh, so the grave markers for dead objects, there's no such thing as a tombstone in Hyperdex. It's gone, it's gone, and uh, I just need to worry about the old location to the new location, but that's the only thing I need to worry about. So now the crucial thing, of course, is what, how do we deal with, um, with uh, fault tolerance? And if you follow the protocol so far, it's pretty straightforward. 
So if I want to deal with the failure of any one node, well, I just double up my nodes. I just create longer chains. And, uh, and when it's time to do a write, my writes simply go through a host and its replica, and the next host and its replica, and then the next host and its replica, and so forth. And now if something terrible happens, and I lose that host or that one, it's not a big deal, because there is a copy of the same object on its replica at all times. So this is a pretty nice uh, feature of the system. So, okay, what does this protocol give us? It gives us atomicity, right? It gives us ordering, it gives us relocation, all happens inside the same protocol layer. So this guy is uh, in charge of sequencing every single transaction that comes in for this object. So if there are multiple people trying to write to the same item, no big deal. Uh, this is the guy who's going to say, well, X happened before Y happened before Z, and that's the order. There is no disagreement. There is no version conflict. If you dealt with Mongo, there's this thing called uh, version reconciliation. None of that. There's no last writer wins, right? It's, uh, the sequencing happens over there, and it's once and for all. So this is, I think, a very powerful primitive, and this is what everything else is based on. So are we good on this front? The last thing I want to tell you about very briefly is how to do multi-key transactions. This is, has been sort of a unicorn in the NoSQL world. And uh, in particular, what people want to do is they want to be able to have something like a NoSQL data store where the data is sharded, divided, and distributed. And they want to be able to update multiple data items at the same time. So for example, I want to be able to write to your bank account stored over here and uh, his bank account over there, right? I want to facilitate some exchange between your bank account and his. So this is a little hard to do. So what are the options? Well, you could use something like Mongo and, uh, and then you could just essentially sort of What's, again, spray and pray. You just write to two locations without any consistency. And there will be a time when you know, the write has happened partially over here, but not over there. And the amount of money in your bank has sort of fluctuated. So they create money out of the sky, like maybe or lose money. And it would be a terrible situation. Um, another thing I could do is, uh, if you've heard of uh, algorithms like Paxos or two-phase commit, if those of you with the database background have heard of two-phase commit. I could actually make sure that all operations, all transactions go through a transaction manager and we do a two-phase commit or, or we do a Paxos agreement on what happened before and what else. So that's okay, except it's really, really, really heavyweight. And I want to tell you the sort of the key intuition behind what makes Hyperdex so fast. And the key intuition is this. Suppose there's two people over here who want to do a transaction, okay? And uh, so, you know, um, so let's see, uh, Furat wants to give some money to Dennis over here. And the two of you over there, you want to exchange some money. So that's fine. Um, what most people would do is they, the transaction manager would say, well, okay, th these two guys, these two writes happen before those two writes, or vice versa. They will sequence all four of those writes. But if you think about it, these two writes cannot possibly affect what happens over on that side. Let me see if I have a proper picture of this. Um, uh, okay, so what the, the key insight here is this. If there's A and B exchanging money and C and D exchanging money over there, these, these transactions can happen simultaneously and without coordination. Why? Because they're completely independent from each other. The only time, in fact, if A and B are exchanging money, B and C are exchanging money, and C and D are exchanging money, there's like a like a U-shaped thing happening, that's okay as well. The only time that we could have a violation of a timeline, a violation of, sort of uh, serializability, is if there's a cycle. That is, you're giving money to him, he's giving money to him, he's giving money to him, and he's giving money to you. If that's happening, then I need to actually worry about exactly how these sequences, how these operations actually mesh together. But if there is no cycle, then there cannot be a violation of what we call serializability requirements. And so that's a very powerful primitive. And uh, the core idea in uh, Hyperdex is essentially a cycle detection algorithm. We're going to allow operations to sort of hit the data center at full speed without coordination, without sequencing them, because they don't need to be sequenced. They're not, they're not related. They cannot interfere as long as there is no cycle. 
So the core idea, as I said, is, uh, is that cycle detection algorithm that makes the uh, transactions fast. So this makes us, I think, a, a unique contender in this space. It's only Hyperdex that has um, asset transactions and Foundation DB that has asset transactions. So let's see. Um, the implementation is uh, sort of, uh, it's uh, fairly substantial by now. It's more than 100,000 lines of code. We support C, C++, Java, Python, Go, Ruby, and Node.js. Are there no, what's big in Turkey? Is Node big in Turkey? No. Is it Java? Java is big? Yeah. Yeah? OK. Uh, good. Yeah, so we support Java routines. In fact, we support all of them with about the same level of uh, quality because they all actually use the underlying uh, library. It's all open source. You can take it. It's free. Um, and there's a very active user community with lots of contributors. So let me show you how this works in practice. So when, uh, so you can go to, do people use Docker? Have people heard of Docker? And virtual machines, okay. So we have a bunch of Docker virtual machines. You can take Hyperdex slash Quick Start, I think. Um, you just run it, and uh, it gives you a sort of a nice playground uh, to play in. Uh, so what you can do is you just create a space. In this case, it's a phone book. You can do a put operation. This is the, the object for John Smith. The key is J Smith. Here's the object, here's the last name, here's the phone number. And then if you do a get, well, then you get what you put. Right? This is not a big deal. I think this is simple stuff. Um, when it gets exciting is when you start to do things like searches. Here's a search. Give me all the Johns in the world. This is a very efficient operation in Hyperdex for all the reasons I talked about before. Hyperspace, hyperspace hashing makes this efficient. You can do range searches. They're also very efficient. This is give me everybody in this area code. You'll end up getting uh, the right, right people. We have lots of atomic operations. This is a conditional put. So if you can say something like, uh, take my object and, uh, and change the phone number to that as long as the old phone number is this. Okay, so that's a pretty cool op. Uh, and in this case, it will be true. If you issue it again, you won't, it will not succeed because the precondition was not met. Okay? So those of you who have actually, you know, or you can do, do this or you can do atomic ads. So for example, uh, go to this object and atomically add one to the phone number field, and you can see that it's gone up by one. Uh, let's see. Oh, we have a asynchronous operations. This is a kind of a cool feature. Um, if you've played with Mongo, every operation is by default synchronous, so it's sent to a server and you wait for an acknowledgement from a server. In Hyperdex, there is no such thing. Well, I mean, you can, you, we have uh, synchronous operations, but we also have async operations. So I can just go like, up one, up two, up three, and you, I can issue a thousand operations against the data center, and I can wait for all of them to, to complete. So if I'm doing bulk loads or bulk operations, I can do them at very high speed because I'm not waiting for one by one acknowledgements. Um, and creating, uh, creating spaces is easy. Well, we store lots and lots of rich data structures, so things like lists of strings or whatever, lists of any kind, sets, maps, and so forth. Um, and you can specify things like how many, how many failures you want to tolerate. And uh, we have list operations. So this is an atomic operation. They atomically push on the right, uh, to, I don't know, something to the pending messages list. Or if you're building a social network, yeah, OK, that's what's happening here. Uh, get me uh, the pending messages, and there's a message from B. Jones. And, um, and this is, I think, the last uh, little bit, which is um, you can say something like, hey, begin transaction. Uh, get like EGS's account, get Rob's account, just, uh, subtract $1,000 from one of them, add 1,000, and then put it. Uh, and then these set of operations are only visible when you commit. Okay? And then the commit might, uh, you know, will be very, very fast uh, when you issue it. So let me show you how fast it is. So all of this is just sort of bedtime stories. If it's not going to be competitive with Mongo, it's going to be kind of boring. Yes, sir. Say again? Join SQL. Uh, the join. How do you do a join? In NoSQL, you try not to do joins. And uh, what you should be doing, this is the standard NoSQL dogma, and I think this is a good idea. Um, you do the equivalent of a join on the application side. So you will end up getting from a subspace the objects that you care for, and you'll look at them, those objects, and you'll issue manually gets or searches in the second table. So it's manually done. This, most people consider this a feature. I, I can tell that you're skeptical about this, and you have every right to be so. 
So in, in SQL systems, the joins themselves make query optimization very, very difficult. That's why I think most people are frustrated when they try to use Oracle or MySQL or whatever else. Um, in the NoSQL world, the, the cost of a join is essentially pushed back up to the developer. And the developer knows exactly when he's going to incur a very costly operation. And he's going to know exactly how he's going to resolve the join. Essentially, he has to craft his own uh, query and query execution plan. So, you know, that's, uh, that's sort of part of the NoSQL space. We give you lots of super fast operations, but you have to deal with the, the complexity of a join yourself. So, um, yes? Uh, how do you handle ordering sorting? Or do you handle it by few? Um, the, there is, a, yeah, so there is, I think, there's a sorted, sorted get, and um, uh, that's about it, right? So there's, uh, that's, what else can one need in this space? We have a sorted get, and then you can do whatever you want on the client side once you get the search results. Can we sort both fields? Uh, yeah, sure, yeah, yes. <laughs> okay. um, th there's no such thing as an atomic field. There's, this, there's such a thing as an atomic operation. Uh, actually, atomic incremental field, I think, was. Referring. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. No, you can so do anything. Any counter. Yeah, you could use any counter to, to sort by. Yeah. Okay. So, let me tell you a little bit about Yahoo. No, but sorry, about, about benchmarks. Is it is the volume? Okay. Let me tell you a little bit about, uh, about performance. Am I losing the, everybody's getting restless. I'll make it fast. Okay. Um, this whole operation is incredibly, it's nice, but it's pointless if it's slow, okay? Let me show you that it's actually quite fast. So this on the left-hand side is MongoDB. This on the right-hand side is Hyperdex. They've both been configured to work the same way, except, who is this here? Okay. Uh, they've both been configured so that they write to two replicas, um, except one on the left is Mongo and one on the right is Hyperdex. And there's a big difference between Mongo and Hyperdex. Okay, so here's a quick test. So suppose you're, you are Mongo. Suppose your job is to make sure that every data item is written to multiple replicas. Okay, so do you consider a write done when it's been written to all of the replicas, it's option one, all of them, to a majority of the replicas, that's option two, or to just one replica. Which one do you think Mongo does? Majority one first. Hmm? Yeah, not not even one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Fred knows the answer. So most people at this point end up saying, when, when Mongo writes to one, one uh, server, it, it considers it done. No, uh, Mongo, uh, the way it's designed is completely broken. Um, it <laughs> considers a write done when the write has been written out to the uh, outgoing socket buffer of the client. So if I'm doing a write to you guys, even though no packet left my machine, I'm done. Okay, guys like, oh, you know, where's the, did you pay the bill? Oh yeah, it's, it's I paid. It's actually really sitting in the, in the living room. And I put it in an envelope, but it's, it has not been mailed yet. So Mongo is doing Mongo things. So they're cutting all sorts of corners. And yet, this is the sad performance that they get, and this is the Hyperdex performance. So these are workloads. These are all from Yahoo properties on the web. So these, I don't I forget which one is which, but uh, one of them is kind of like a social network. The other is kind of like a session store and so forth. So uh, the fun one to focus on is workload F. That's the one where there, there's a search. But you can see that there's a factor of three or four. Yeah. C update. Um, so let me, well, I'll show you which one is which. Yes? I mean, I, considering the all loading, I, I, I cannot comprehend. How come Hyperdex is faster Faster in when, it, when it's writing? Like, right, good question. That, that, that was the... Good question. So, okay, so I showed you a bunch of tricks, right? And uh, so the tricks explain some of the speed, but not, not all of it. And in fact, bulk loading is a case where we should not be faster than that. But the way they've been written, <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. Um, the, way, the way that code has been written, it's been written by different teams in, that are separated and layered. So they make a gazillion different copies of that one data item that you want to write. And uh, it's, that's one problem. Second problem is it's a synchronous write as opposed to an asynchronous bulk write. Okay. Um, so, so that's the uh, sort of the outlook. Um, if we look at it in more detail, this is workload B. Somebody was asking about it. 
Sure, yeah. If it's writing in synchronous, how long does it check if it's written at least once? Did I get it wrong? Um, the synchronous writes are essentially being queued to your outgoing write buffer. As soon as that's there, it goes as done, goes on to the next one. But if you do enough of them, of course, the next write is going to get blocked until these things trickle out, right? It's like a, it's like a leaky bucket kind of thing. Right? Um, I don't know, if you want to look at this in more detail, you can see that across the board, we're a lot faster. Uh, we're blue here, and Mongo is this weird green, neon green, and uh, R's are reads, and U's are up, updates, and uh, these circuit type things are updates. It's no, no, square type things are updates, and uh, they're very, very slow when it comes to an update. So uh, uh, this is uh, the load data set. I don't know, it's just, we're just much faster across the board. Um, so, but there is a cost, so don't, don't let me just get out of here by, you know, after saying, oh, we're just better across the board. We're not better across the board. We do pay a cost, and the cost that we pay is proportional to the number of servers we need to touch, right? So this chain, chaining trick that I showed you ensures that we have consistency and fault tolerance and blah, blah, blah. It's very nice, but um, the more of those servers you have in a row, the bigger the cost is going to be. And in this case, you can see that you know, if you have 20, 20 servers, uh, the, the latency will go from one millisecond to about six milliseconds. Um, in uh, actual client deployments, we typically see chain lengths of 12 or so. So this is the important part. And uh, if you compare this to the average Mongo latency, this is a few times faster than the average Mongo latency that goes to just one node. Yeah. yeah is this why you're comparing it mainly to Mongo? Because you're aiming nodes between size 4 to 20? No. Because mainly Cassandra installations are like 500 servers and latency might get really high? No, no. Um, I have comparisons to Cassandra. We're about a factor of two faster than Cassandra as well. Uh, Cassandra is incredibly good at write speeds. So you can write to Cassandra at uh, pretty, pretty darn high rates. Um, but when it's time to read them, you're going to incur problems as well. And so any benchmark where it's a mix of reads and writes, they also do really badly. Uh, this, uh, this latency calculation, I, I think, probably disregards uh, network latency. Mm -hmm. as in no, no, it's a full end-to-end -end benchmark. It's a real data center with 18 hosts, a uh, bunch of clients. Okay, so so forth. And it's a gigabit network. It's a real actual network with switches and stuff. Oh, yeah, <coughs> how does this uh, actually perform in multi-data center environments? Like um, you would not want to deploy Hyperdex across multiple data centers because you don't want your chains going across a. Well, this is not how people deploy Mongo either. Yeah, okay. but we, we, we have to, you know, uh, do this to, to ensure some. Uh, disaster recovery. Yes, you absolutely have to do disaster recovery. Let me let me get there. Okay, so I'm almost there. Uh, oh, this is the scalability. It's like it's fine. You can scale this up. Uh, we've scaled it up to about 300 nodes. It's not shown here. So you, you can deploy on EC2 and go as far to the right as you like. Um, the transactions, the multi-key transactions, this is, a, this is the TPCC benchmark. It's a standard benchmark in databases. Let me show you how this plays out. So this is Hyperdex without any transactional support. So when I'm doing writes, I just do them without any transactional guarantees. So this is kind of like the best uh, state of the art that I know of. This is two-phase commit, the stuff that we teach all the undergraduates when they take a database course. Uh, we tell them, okay, well, you know, here's how two-phase commit works, prepare, commit, blah, blah, blah. Um, but this, of course, incurs the overhead of sequencing operations that are unrelated to each other. So that suddenly takes your throughput down to about, uh, about uh, a third of what it is. This is Hyperdex Warp. It's about 2% lower than Hyperdex. And the reason for this is in typical operations, these transactions are not conflicting. I can have many, many, many transactions outstanding in my data center because most of the time there will be no circular dependency. There will be no violation of the, of the timeline. And I can let those operations go at full speed. I don't need to actually slow anybody down and say, you'd better just stay put because uh, otherwise that, the, the timeline would be violated. So, Okay, so that brings me to, yeah, okay, I'll skip this. That brings me to your other question, I think, which is what happens for uh, across multiple data centers. 
So I think the right way to deal with, oh, maybe not. Um, I'll come back to it later, but uh, um, let me just address it. The right way to deal with multiple data center issues is to take a consistent snapshot at one data center and to push from the consistent snapshot to the remote, the secondary site. That's how we handle that. And uh, so that's a feature that nobody else that I know of has, which is take a consistent snapshot across a ginormous data center. And that's the feature that we support. So we can take a snapshot at the data level, at the data file level. Um, so it takes about 200 milliseconds or so. We essentially push a token into every single server. Everybody who sees that token uh, takes a snapshot, moves on to a different file, and then we can copy those files to the other side. OK, so what's the takeaway? We're much faster. We're, we're faster by a factor of two to four. Um, for some workloads, we're faster by a factor of three. For some other workloads, like realistic workloads, we've seen deployments where we got um, essentially a factor of 10 speed up for a particular client that we were supporting. So this thing is actually pretty darn quick. So how does this all happen? Let me, for those of you who've been indoctrinated by the CAP theorem. So as uh, Dennis mentioned, I'm a professor at Cornell. The CAP theorem, uh, we're on the East Coast in the US. The CAP theorem came out of my colleagues who were at Berkeley on the West Coast. My good colleague, Eric Brewer, uh, stood up about 15 years ago and he said, look, I have this really big insightful statement. Consistency, availability, partition tolerance, pick at most two. And, uh, and ever since, all these developers in the Valley are like sort of confused about this. And I want to sort of set the record straight because if you actually follow Hacker News or whatever else, you will have heard of this crap and, uh, and you may not know how to actually react to it. So the CAP theorem is indeed a statement that is correct, but it's not a theorem, it's a tautology. So I'm not saying that it's wrong. What I'm saying is it's not even wrong, it's unfalsifiable. Okay, so it's one of these statements which is meaningless. And it certainly doesn't mean what most people think it means. Let me show you why it's kind of a meaningless statement. So that's the statement. If you look at this carefully, this thing doesn't type check. Those of you who are Java programmers, when we know that the program doesn't type check, what do we know about that program? It's broken, right? So consistency, that sounds like a good thing. It's, it's a property of a system, right? That's the type of that thing. It's a property of a system. It's, in fact, a safety property. Availability is a property of a system. It's a liveness property. It's the mother of all liveness properties, right? You can't just as you should be available. OK, well, it's right there, available. There's no stronger property when it comes to liveness than availability. Well, partition tolerance. So this is where I think Eric Brewer got kind of confused. It sounds like a property of a system, doesn't it? It kind of does. Yeah, I think so. Um, but it really isn't. It's got nothing to do with the system itself at all. If it were a property of the system, it would be a liveness property. But I have the, the mother of all liveness properties over here. It can't possibly add anything to this big statement over there. So what is it really about? Well, this is really a property of the failure model. What it's really saying is I can have a failure where half this room can get divided and I cannot reach anybody on the second half of the room. That's what it says. So this really relates to attacks against my system. And these two things relate to properties of my own system. So already you can see that whoever formulated this wasn't really thinking clearly. And therefore, any conclusion that you might draw from this is going to be kind of odd. So anything that does not type check, it's got an issue. So. Let's see, but that's not all. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about the proof sketch for the CAP theorem so you understand how the theorem works out. And, uh, and let, me, uh, let me then talk about why the CAP theorem is actually not at all insightful. So the proof is very simple, okay? If, I'm, if, I'm, uh, if I have a system with two hosts, A and B, and, uh, and I want the system to always return consistent answers. I want these guys to say, you know, Dennis's phone number is X, and I want both of them to always say the same X. If they differ, then I will be inconsistent. And the way consistency, sorry, the way availability is defined, okay, so these theoreticians who came up with the, 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 the definition of, of availability, they believe that if a request comes to this host, this host must answer it. And if it doesn't, then it's unavailable. And if another request comes to this host, this one must answer. There is no notion of redirecting requests. 
Okay, so if I get a request here, I'd better answer it, and therefore, uh, you know, if I can't, I'm unavailable. Well, if this is the case, and you have partitions, so that is, I have two hosts, they must answer every query, and yet they cannot communicate with each other because there could be a partition. I have one link, and that one link could go down. Well, then, of course, I will be faced with a dilemma. The dilemma is, if I have no network, they can't communicate, they either must shut up, one of them should shut up and let the other one answer, and that will be consistent but unavailable, or um, they, uh, they both answer, but they are not in sync anymore, and they're inconsistent. This is the theorem, okay, the theorem. Well, this wasn't really a theorem. This was just a con conf uh, conflict in our definitions. If you define your availability this way, of course you're going to end up drawing this lesson. But of course it's meaningless, because this is not how a system designer ought to be thinking about availability. When we design systems, we think about properties at the boundary, not at the individual server level. If my, server, my system is up, then when the request comes in, I should answer it. But not because, well, it's, it's not the case that every single server ought to answer every single request that comes to it. So I typically will be able to have some kind of a redirector that sends requests to a server uh, that, of my own choosing. So this definition of availability is incredibly broken, and that's part of the reason why the cap is uh, as unsatisfiable as it sounds. And really, what's going on here is that the partition uh, tolerance business, what it's really saying is that the kinds of failures you might face are really, really, really strong. That is, you can really have terrible failures where you have two servers, one network, one link. Your entire network is one link, and your adversary can come and break that link. I had one network, and it's gone. Okay, So if that's the case, well, then why is this a meaningful, meaningful theorem at all? So I can give you, you know, I call this the Sirer's uh, not A theorem. Availability, however you define it, is not achievable. This is my theorem, okay? Well, okay, and here's my proof. If you have a bunch of machines and God doesn't like you, they all go down, now you're not available, okay? This is not an insightful statement. And, uh, and yet, it's about as insightful as the cap theorem. If you have a network, somebody takes away the entire network, well, then now you can't be consistent and available. Well, yeah, no shit. You know, that is not a surprising result. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just what it is. It's, it's just not insightful. It's a tautology. It is bereft of insight or implications. So really, the takeaway, I think, is the cap theorem is, is what it is. It's a fine set of statement. It's a, no, it's a fine statement that says these two things, if you define them, uh, and you throw the, the partition business into it, they are not achievable at the same time, but it's not a big deal, okay? What you typically want to care about is your database at the service boundary of the database is consistent and available, and typically you will qualify that with respect to a failure model that is somewhat uh, limited. That is, if God is really angry at you and he's going to take away your whole network or your whole set of servers, Yes, you cannot be consistent or available. That is true. But, um, but if you could actually sort of constrain just how terrible the failures are, if your DevOps team can say, look, you will have at most four failures at any one time. If you have more than that, we'll rush in and we'll fix things. Well, then suddenly you can actually provide guarantees. And it becomes quite possible to actually issue those kind of guarantees. So we're by no means the only system that does this. And, uh, and so, um, so, anyway, so I think the takeaway is uh, cap, what CAP says is if you cannot limit the number of faults and the requests can be directed to any server and you insist on serving every request, then you cannot possibly be consistent. I think that's what it says. So if you were to break any of those assumptions, then you can suddenly do something that what most people think is impossible under the CAP. So what Hyperdex does is it says, look, just tell me the number of simultaneous failures you want to deal with, and I will, I will replicate the data to ensure that uh, you can handle um, that many outages at the same time. Okay, so uh, take my takeaway from this is there is a cap theorem that is insightful, but it's not the same cap that the Berkeley people have been talking about. So the real cap theorem, I think, has to do with three properties that actually are properties of systems between consistency, availability, and performance. That's, I think, the real trade-off. 
you can make something more available, but it comes at the cost of performance because you have to replicate more. Uh, you can try to make things more consistent by having extra communication, again, at the expense of performance. Or so you have less of these uh, and so forth. So, um, so Hyperdex achieves consistency and availability and, uh, and, of course, performance to the level that you want to trade those off against each other. And it's a knob that's under your control. So I think I mentioned this before. We also have some nice features from a DevOps perspective. We have backups that are super fast and they're consistent across a data center. Um, we have security where every single object has a, what we call a Mac room. This is a recent uh, idea that came out of Google uh, where every single data item is protected by a capability. And, uh, and a client is unable to touch that data item unless he or she is able to provide a key that unlocks that particular item. So this is a super fast operation. It's, uh, it's pretty nice in the sense that I, essentially the idea here is this. Um, the, the work that we are building on came out of Google. Google is holding everybody's email in Gmail, right? And they routinely have servers compromised. So when somebody compromises a front-end server, you don't want that guy to be able to read everything in the back-end database. So uh, what macaroons allow you to do is they allow you to say, well, look, this client is only authorized to touch the data items belonging to those people who are currently going through that server. So if I'm using that particular machine, an attacker will end up being able to read my mail, but my mail only, not anybody else's. So that's what Hyperdex implements. This is per data object uh, capabilities. And, uh, and the deployment is really easy. Uh, you, could, you could create an auto-scaling cluster in about 30 seconds. I thought about running this uh, demo, but uh, it's a little hard to set up with my laptop at the moment because we'll have to switch. Uh, but it's really, really easy. You just start a VM, and you throw in more VMs, and they will configure themselves and partition the data. So um, I think that's all I really wanted to touch upon today. Um, Hyperdex is a second generation NoSQL system. It does what a lot of people thought was impossible. Um, but that's because what they, they falsely thought, they believed in an impossibility result that wasn't uh, founded, uh, wasn't, wasn't on a strong foundation. So um, it's a high, high speed uh, system. It uh, very recently had added support for documents, so you can store JSON objects in addition to uh, the sort of the more traditional schema-based objects that I just talked about. So I think that's really it. If I have, if you have any questions, I'll take them. Yeah. Sure. So. Uh I didn't really get where the morph stands within the Hyperdex. So is this something separate? That's yes. Deployed? Yes. So there's Hyperdex, that's the free core. And uh, there's warp, which is an add-on uh, that we license. Okay. So but, it's yeah. like a transaction engine? Yeah, it's a transaction. It's just essentially a, a, an additional API. So uh, is there any parts of this system which are not completely distributed? Like, is there mm -hmm. any? Absolutely. No, absolutely not. But there is such a thing as a coordinator. So there's the shards that hold the data, and there's a coordinator that holds, it's kind of like the name node in, in Hadoop, right? Um, it holds the configuration information for the rest of the system. But unlike name node, it's actually replicated, distributed, it has many, many replicas, you can have as many replicas of that thing as you want, um, and um, it's consulted very rarely. So when a client comes up, it wants to, it needs to learn the structure of the data center. It contacts the uh, the, the coordinator just once, and from then on, it just runs. Great. Yes. Uh, well, it's it's gonna take some effort from you to answer this because I'm not like I I, I couldn't like fully grasp certain certain okay. uh, parts. Okay. I'll do my best. Uh, uh, I mean. From um, in traditional uh, databases, we know that the more indexes we have, the longer it will take to insert data sure. into the system. Yes. Uh, in Hyperdex, if I get it correctly, our like every dimension in our manifold, uh, like every uh, function representing our dimension, which is the hash function for that dimension. Yes. Uh, it's an index for us. Uh, no, not an index. Not an index? Not an index. 
Um, but keep going because you're on to, you've got some of the intuition that's critical, which is as you have more dimensions, the cost of inserting an object can increase. I mean, uh, that's true. Through my own point of view, yeah. my, I, my intuition is that it would go to like, like something exponential. No, but, yeah? no, definitely it's linear, as, as you can see in the graphs before. So if you look at this, these graphs, uh, up, up, where are we? Uh, th yeah, this is a this is a graph of chain length versus versus. I mean that makes sense, right? Because you're going through so many servers, and every server adds some processing time. And as you have more of them, it's linear in the number of servers is you it, have. Is it the number of servers or number of dimensions? If I have ah, like a right. row of data with like uh, thousands of uh, columns in it, right? And if I would like to represent it in the in in the yeah, if you actually manifold, right. then wouldn't it create uh, an exponential, this is called an exponential explosion. In terms right. of I.O., I mean. Right, I no, okay. So um, there's a name for this in databases. This is not a new problem for us. It's called the curse of multidimensionality. And so you're in indeed right, at least at the intuition level, that as you have more dimensions um, and you want to have sort of you want to be able to refine the search on any one dim uh, dimension, that means that you're going to need a server or something to divide the data items along that dimension. And so that's going to sort of exponentially increase. That is true. So if you have like a thousand dimensions, what you really should do is break them up into smaller chunks uh, in that subspace pattern that I described before. So if you have just one big undifferentiated space, it will be multi, it will be exponentially, it will take a lot of nodes uh, to, to sort of get good spread of that data. That is true. Um, but, uh, uh, but having divided your, so, okay. Well, let's just like, let's take some case, right? So suppose you have a data item with a thousand dimensions and you divide it into some subspaces, each of which have say four or five dimensions. Um, getting, getting that, uh, yeah, if you do the math actually, it suddenly goes from really high exponents to some of small exponents which is going to be a fairly manageable number of servers to get the, re the, the definition that you need. That makes sense? Yeah, Okay. Makes sense. And I, I presume even within a single server, the, the logic still applies, right? Mm -hmm. For every dimension. Absolutely. Right. That's very insightful. It took me a little while to, to come up with that. But on a single server, the way we locate data was ex used to be, it has changed since then, but our first implementation of this, we also used the same hyperspace hashing trick. We kept track of many different files, uh, and each file corresponded to a little cube within that server, and, uh, and then that way we could do real easy handoffs from one server to the other. We've since then switched. We end up building on something called LevelDB um, as our backend, but, uh, but that was our core idea. So the whole thing actually recursively applies inside the server. Very insightful. Thank you. Anyone else? Do you guys have a question? I'll take questions in Turkish too if you want me to. Anyone else? I didn't mean to interrupt your conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, I don't know. So, uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, just a small question. Uh, in terms of uh, performance, we add servers to increase the performance, mm -hmm. right? But it will add our right performance, the right performance. Is there a way to break that um, constancy? Yeah. Is there a way to break it? Break That's a good question. So, no. <laughs> this is quick, quick, quick and easy answer. Short answer is no. no. So, I think in many ways, distributed systems is a game of trade-offs. And there are some trade-offs that are really, you know, they're just fundamental. So, replication is a good thing to have. It's good for for read performance, but there is a cost you pay for on the right side. Um, I don't know what anybody can do to help that. Um, so, uh. <laughs> okay. Well, so this is this has been fun. Um, right. So, let me. Okay. Uh, what what sort of systems would you recommend Hyperdex for? Like, yeah. or what sort of problems Hyperdex is Good question. Very good question. So we've we've deployed it with a bunch of startups doing all sorts of weird things that have nothing to do with each other. Um, so let's see. 
Okay, so it used to be that, um, that we were very good when the data was structured, when there was a, a fixed schema. Um, and in fact, it was a big bit of a hassle to change from one schema to another. It turns out that it's actually fairly easy to change schemas. If I go back a lot to some picture like this, oh, here we go. So suppose you want to change your schema. You suppose you want to add another, you know, you want to change, you want to create a three-dimensional subspace. What we do is we create another space over here, and we just replicate things in the background, and it just kind of seamlessly goes over there. So, um, but still, it does take some effort. So if you have a lot of data, and you are routinely and very, very, very like, frequently changing the schema itself, we are probably not the best fit for you. Um, but um, people who are storing things like, okay, what have we been used for? Session stores, um, really high dimensional data on publications. Um, there's one company that's actually doing an enormous number of joins per second. They, uh, they want to be able to say things like relate, um, I don't know, asbestos usage to uh, this kind of cancer. And so you, there will not be a typical, typically there won't be a single study that actually relates this. There's going to be a study that relates asbestos usage to a whole lot of similar pathways. And then those pathways impact other pathways which might finally impact cancer. So they want to essentially join all these uh, academic studies to find a path. And uh, these guys are doing huge numbers of searches to discover uh, these paths in this uh, system. Um, what else are people using this for? LinkedIn is using it as a column store, doing enormous amounts of uh, processing on its data. Um, so it's kind of hard for me to tell when it's, uh, it's, it's, I think when the schema changes a lot, I would say, we're probably not the best fit for you. Um, that, that's really the case. So as I said, it's open source, it's easy to take, and uh, the licensing terms for support and uh, for warp itself are incredibly, uh, you know, they're very nice for startups. So if you guys are doing startups, uh, it's like really almost no money, we just give it to you guys. And the, with the hope that you'll strike it rich. And when you do become a non-startup, a big company, then you'll still continue to pay us. So, um, so that's what we've been doing. You guys should know about this. There aren't that many players in this space. I see a lot of people going to just, they just reach for Mongo whenever they need a NoSQL data store. And Mongo is going to kill someone. Like it really will kill someone. Maybe it's already killed some people. I just don't know. Um, it certainly has lost a lot of money. We know that much. Right? This thing used to power a whole bunch of Bitcoin exchanges. And uh, where you, I don't know if you guys may, followed uh, the news. Last March and April, uh, somebody went to almost every Bitcoin exchange and they took advantage of uh, just how terrible Mongo was by starting a lot of, uh, a lot of transactions at the same time. And, uh, and it just keeps, it just loses track of how much money got subtracted. It was not me. <laughs> no, I did not do this. Um, I thought about it, but I, did not. I knew it was going to happen, but it was not me. Um, so, so Poloniex, Flexcoin, I think, is, was one exchange that actually uh, uh, just had to shut down. People stole too much money. It's about a million, more than a million dollars. And uh, Poloniex lost a bunch of money to this. So Mongo is going to kill someone. Don't be the guy who kills people by picking a bad database. Pick anything else. You don't have to pick the Hyperdex. Just pick anything else. Yeah, yeah. What's the biggest commercial usage of Hyperdex right now? Uh, what it does that mean? Confidential. It is confidential um, because it's backend stuff. But uh, let's just say a large, large phone company. And how many nodes or what's the number of the data? Can you give us some figures about that? Uh, no, I cannot. I can <laughs> say that we have deployed it on as many as, uh, uh, let's see, what's the biggest we've deployed it? Um, a few hundred nodes. And uh, the typical installation is typically much smaller than that. I would say the median installation is four to eight nodes. That's what a, m most normal people start at. Like, every big data system is initially a small data system, right? And you need to, be, you need to make sure that, that that case is handled well. I think we handled that case really well. Um, you don't want something smaller than three nodes, in my experience, because then, you know, just a single failure will take out too much data. But you know, um, so most people start small, and uh, but then you can grow to as as large as you want. 
And what about the size of the data? Like, uh, how That's unlimited. The no, but, one big limitation that we have that you should keep in mind is uh, the object size is, is limited to 64 megabytes. Okay. Uh, I was actually asking about the uh, like in operation, like how, how big data you multiply multiply 400 by the amount of data you can put into a single node. Okay. You know, you'll just get something much more than that, four, more, four terabytes. Mm. No, you can do much more than that. Mm. One so. Sorry, uh, four terabytes times 400. Okay, so I have not done that, that's a lot, but yes, you can do that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So, yes. Uh, maybe a silly question, but uh, your uh, hash functions are to, I mean, are you distributing data between nodes? Yes. Or are you distributing, like, processes between nodes? No, every node runs a set of processes that we define, and the data is sharded through the hash functions. Okay. And we have a number of different hash functions you could use. You probably want to use a different hash function for dates versus numbers versus uh, strings. So, I mean, if we have a cluster, we shouldn't expect a homogeneous workload. No, you should not expect, you should, uh, yeah, so there could easily be load imbalances. Uh, if you define your spaces badly or your hash function isn't working well for your data. That is true. So uh, so typically, that's why we give you multiple hash functions. If you're storing geographic data, you'll want a geographic hash function. We give you one. If you're storing data, uh, date time data, we give you a date time hash function. So those work well. Yeah? What type of functions are you going to do local features, such as storage or... Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we are building a whole bunch of things on top of this. So this is the foundation of our, of our, uh, uh, you know, of our, everything else that we're building. So the, one of the things that we recently built is a graph store on top that I um, didn't get a chance to talk about. It's called Weaver. We just released it for beta usage. Um, and it's for storing things like the social graph, right? You know, I'm a friend of yours, you're a friend of this and that. And uh, if that graph is really, really, really large, and it can be, or if you're doing processing on it that involves in substantial effort, then you want to shard it and replicate it. So Weaver is a sharded, replicated, distributed, decentralized, transactional <laughs> graph store. Okay, so, uh, and it's all based on this stuff underneath, plus additional mechanisms for, uh, for, for coordination. I'm also developing a, um, what uh, I think is a transactional file system uh, on top of, uh, on top of this. Is there a question over there? You guys are like, I see the eyebrows getting like this. This is when I do teach undergrad. So every time I see this, it's like alarm bells go off and I have to say, hey, can I help you? Is there something I can help with? OK, shoot. What happens? I know you can answer, but what happens when the role thing of things are? No problem. Let me repeat the question. What happens when the role leader fails, right? Very good question. When this guy fails, he goes away, and this guy becomes the next next role leader. When he comes back, this is the critical part. When he comes back, you do not make him the head of the row. The critical thing in any chain is that the guys towards the left know more than the guys towards the right. So what happens is when this guy dies and he comes back, he gets inserted at the tail of this little chain over here, and he makes it. Everybody makes their. Everybody gets bumped up. And so if you bring him back over to here, then he will have missed some updates, and uh, he's going to be very confused. So when you put him at the tail end of the chain, then he, ends, he has a chance to pick it up and, uh, and get the timelines uh, sorted out. That was a good question. And the second one is, I know that uh, we have, let's assume that we have a structured data and we have many attributes. Yeah. And we define uh, dimensions for it, I yes. and we can define it also subspaces. Mm -hmm. And at any point, I realized that I didn't define a subspace, you know, uh, the way you want I, to. I didn't push it, you know, I didn't uh, guess Great. about it. Great. So, and when I made a get query, yep. uh, for an out of subspace, I don't know the term. I got it, yep. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Very good question. So, this was first name, last name, that was age and gender. And then you do a first name and gender, let's say, right? That's a that's a weird uh, weird query that 
uh, only handles one, one axis over here and one axis over there. Uh, what Hyperdex will do is it will pick the most discriminating subspace. In this case, both subspaces are not very discriminating. And it's going to pick, I think it's going to pick that one just because it's first. And it's going to run, it's going to do a not very specific search. Had you defined a subspace that was first name gender, then it would have been very, very efficient. And in this case, we would call this a failure of the user to define a good, good space. We'll give, we do give you a whole lot of metrics in a network operations center that shows the times when this happens. So if you see that this is happening, you just create a new subspace and we'll just create it for you. So uh, that, that's sort of the best we can do. Um, yeah, so the, the principle here is send the query to the most discriminating subspace. If there was a four-dimensional subspace and you, your query had specified only three of them, that's still a, you know, that's a fine search. It could be more specific, but it's still like it brings it down to just one unknown axis. So uh, that's an okay thing to do. Uh, can we use uh, sub, uh, can we use a dimension in multiple subspaces? Yes, the same dimension can appear in multiple subspaces. Yeah, absolutely. There's no, no problem at all. Right. Are you using Zookeeper to keep your... No, we do not use Zookeeper. We use our own uh, replicated state machine. Not, not Zookeeper. What? Was it something Dennis was working on? Uh, no, we started out uh, with something that Dennis was working on, but this is something different. Uh, we use Replicant. It's based exactly on the same idea as Dennis's work, actually, which is um, uh, we take an object and we replicate it. And uh, that, that, yeah, so th this, is, this gets back to the coordinator question. So uh, you need somebody to say, that guy is dead. You should really go and talk to that guy as, as sort of a, uh, the next person in line. So that has to be an atomic decision. It has to be a global consensus-based decision. Because if I'm skipping over and he's not skipping over the same node, we're screwed. We're going to end up seeing different values. So we ensure that those things, anytime I think somebody is dead, I report it to the coordinator and he decides for all of us in a global way. Another question, sure. uh, just because of, I'm, I've been joined by Mongo like lots of times. Uh, is there any kind of blocking mechanism that is currently used, like uh, being or uh, is these? Uh, there should be blocking mechanisms. There are many locks, many, 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 many fine-grained locks that you never see. Yeah. Right. Uh, as opposed to the Mongo way of doing things, which is the one big Mongo lock. And um, no, we don't have a single lock. We're, this is a very fine grain. This is also part of the reason why we're faster, right? It's, essentially, we're fast because um, my team is actually pretty darn good. They're the hacker in charge of this, Robert Escriva, is an amazing implementer. Did you um, this in Go? No, yeah. no, we do. We support Go fully, but the code itself is C++. Uh, it looks very much like Go code. It's very stylized, but it's uh, C++. Um, but one of the things he did was make sure that all the objects that we ever hold down are locked for a very short period of time, and there are many, many different locks, and uh, nobody, none of the objects really holds anybody else down uh, or retards the progress of another, another operation. So that's sort of uh, what we work on. You, I'm seeing that eyebrow again. It's, uh, it's oh no, okay, this time we're good, okay. <laughs> yes? Uh, the client know all the state of the servers? Yes, indeed. The client has to know the state of all servers, and it acquires that state by talking to the coordinator when it comes up. So the coordinator is in charge of everybody else. Essentially, you just imagine a God's eye view of everybody who's in the cluster, and you say, hey, who's where? And once you know that they're laid out like this, you know, you know exactly who should be part of the chain. Yeah. Yes? Is there any versioning system? Yes, behind the cover. There should be something. Yes, of course there should be something. It's behind the covers, though. So you never are faced. The guarantee here is very strong. You'll never see an out-of-date object. So you are never in a position where you see, oh, this is version 15 and this is version 11, and there are some conflicting rights that you have to reconcile. That never happens. Uh, so there is a bunch of versions, um, and uh, you just never see them. As a client, there's no interface by which you ever get to see one. So uh, maybe I didn't understand. You write something for all people. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you handle many things, and it's uh, you communicate with another server. Sure. Like that. Yeah, like next the chain. Yes. Yeah, okay. And it's, let's assume that it communicates with another, and then raw leader 
goes down, great. There will be new rolling, and they will continue the chain or something like that. So this guy goes down, and uh, did this guy see it? He saw it. So they will immediately know uh, that there will be a new rolling or not. You know. Mm, so typically, there is no such thing as immediate, right? So typically, this guy dies. Somebody decides that he's dead. Some, the client that's talking to this guy decides, hey, this role leader is not responding. Or the coordinator pings it and says, this guy is not responding. OK, that's step one. Step two, we strike him out. Step three, when this guy is struck out, the client gets sent a, re a response that says, unfortunately, this guy is dead. You should retry your operation. And he's going to retry the operation with that guy in mind. So I will lose my data, or I will have to reboot it. The client binding, not the client itself, your code doesn't have to even see this. The client binding will reissue the same write to this guy, and the write will hopefully complete the second time. The second time. Right. But if it doesn't, it's fine. If it has already completed, then this guy will say, aha, you're trying to do the same write again. I already wrote that one. That could also happen. There are lots of corner cases. I'm giving you the general principle, which then the general principle is coordinator decides who's alive. Everybody is keeping tabs on everybody else, including the client keeping tabs on the role leader. I think you're rightfully pointing out that the role leader is kind of special. Uh, but maybe you should also keep in mind that the client is pinging on the, on the role leader itself. So if the role, role leader fails, I suppose I'm a client, you know, and he's my role leader, and I sent him a request, and somehow he happens to be dead. Well, no big deal. I'll ask the coordinator again. My new role leader is right here. I'll go through him. And if it turned out that he already, like most of the operation is complete, then he's going to say, no, no big deal. Your operation is complete. Every single request carries a client attached request ID, as well as there is an object version number inside. So there are two different systems. The new role leader is selected from the chain. Maybe selected from the chain. And when it goes up, you can see that I, I have this version and which versions you guys have, and then they can pull because there are some systems. I hear you. Lots of other systems do that. The reason why they do that is because they can never tell who's in charge, right? So suppose this was a replica group, these three guys, and, uh, and I was writing to them like in parallel as a client, which is what a lot of systems do, right? If I'm writing to them in parallel, and, and he's writing to them in parallel as well, they're seeing a whole bunch of different versions, and if one of them dies and there's a membership change, now it's like she and the two of them are here, right? So they, they have to ask themselves, like, who's got the most up-to-date version of each data item? This is a hard question, right? It's really, really tough because, you know, you might have seen some rights and he's seen some other rights and she's, yeah, it's just a mess. But if I line these guys up, like, in the, like you will be lined up in the army if you ever serve, right? That's a pretty strict way of ordering things. And, uh, you know, I should probably go this way. So if I'm over here and he is my role leader, um, then, then he's my role leader. He knows the most. And he knows strictly less, and he knows strictly less. He dies, I fall over to him. And, uh, and there is no question about who, who else to fall over to. There's no need for any of them to actually ask each other about anything. Everything he knows, he knows also. That's, I think, the beauty of the chain operation. And so uh, as, I, as, as he's disappeared from the system, I just bump them up. And the invariant is he whoever is in the front knows the most. I hope that makes sense. I'm going to get out of this this night, but uh, yes. How do you handle Split brain scenario, what's, what's the split brain? There's no, that, that should not happen. We cut, we cut the system in half. Yeah. The coordinator is going to have a minority on one side and a majority on the other side. The majority will make progress, minority will not. That, that's, that's how we, uh, we handle it. You should never have a, an even number of nodes in your coordinator. Thank you very much for coming by. Yeah. There is no merging because when there is a split, we stop the operation of the, of the system in the minority side. When the network recovers, they, oh yeah, they will come in and they will, they will get placed back. Onto these, uh, onto these chains in the sort of the last in the tail position. 
and they will pick up all the changes that happened when they were gone. Yeah, wow, you guys have a lot of questions. Yeah, go ahead. What about data compression? What about data compression? We do nothing whatsoever, um, except we have, um, we have a library for it that almost nobody uses. Um, I believe it's possible, <laughs> but I don't think we've ever enabled it. That's the, the short answer. Um, there have been people who evaluated Hyperdex for really large data. The, I don't know if you guys have heard of the square kilometer array, SKA. These are guys who, um, uh, they essentially have like a, a big one kilometer square uh, full of radio telescopes. And uh, they were getting like a petabyte per second of data or whatever. They're building this thing. It hasn't been built yet. But the idea was they would get enormous amounts of data from, uh, from the sky survey. They would do like, you know, they essentially end up scanning the skies with radios, um, the radio antennas. And, um, and uh, when we were dealing with them, we thought about data compression. But I don't believe that code is exercised much at all. So but if you have really, truly large data, we're happy to support it. I don't think it takes much because we it's all there. Uh, if everything just hits the ground, everything is cool. Okay. But it doesn't start things to crumble. Oh, no, no. no that's, uh, that's a fair, fair, you know, fair thing to conclude. Um, no, no, we, we operate on data sizes that do not fit in RAM all the time. Uh, what's the thing that should fit in RAM? Like subspace definitions or? Um, no, the, it's, it's best if your queries have some temporal pattern. Like over time, like, you know, if I query for X, I also query for Y. If that's the case, then that's great. Um, if that's not the case, we do our best bringing things into memory. Um, and um, so, uh, but we often, often deal with data, data sizes that are far larger than RAM. So think RAM of like eight gigabytes to 16 gigabytes and terabyte of disk. This is not an uncommon scenario. So, um, from my point of view, it, it also is evident that this is a great schema for microcomputation. Like, if you have really small, like lots of really small servers, mm -hmm. this looks like it, it would work like a charm. That's true. I have a colleague who actually built um, a key value store out of uh, super efficient uh, and VRAM backed little microcontrollers. Uh, we have not done this. It would be a good fit for us, but we have we've thought about doing it. Um, it's, uh, his name is David Anderson. He's at CMU, and uh, he built this system called Fawn. And uh, the core idea is, you know, you buy a bunch of these like things that are kind of like Raspberry Pis, and you build a ginormous array of Raspberry Pis where all of them are keeping everything in, in memory. Yeah, it's, it's not a bad idea at all. Um, so he was not using Hyperdex. He was using just consistent hashing. But it would work so much better if you used look if you took advantage of locality and you used hyperspace session. Yeah. Yes. Do you have built-in analytics function? Um, do we have no? We built a bunch of analytics functions on top. So um, uh, you know, so there are a bunch of people who actually use Hyperdex to to run analytics on large data. So they just scan it. You know, they slice it, dice it, they, they compute whatever they want to do. Um, yes? Uh, Which ones? Delegations. Delegations? Delegations. Aggregations. Uh, keep going. Yeah, we just do. We just do a search. Yeah, exactly. Just, just the same way Hadoop would do it and just the same way uh, you would think it ought to work, right? If you're going to do something that touches upon data that's spread around there, you just go and query all of them, and those guys. Um, some cases you might be really, you know, might be bad, and you have to query everybody in the data center. When people use Mongo, they typically send aggrega uh, uh, aggregations to the entire data center. Like this is very common with Mongo. So it it's happens much less rarely, much more rarely, much much less frequently for us. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, there is this uh, some version uh, under the hood somewhere. Yes, definitely. Uh, is there a way to uh, revert all system to a previous version? Absolutely. Yes. This is what the uh, consistent backups are all about. So unlike most other systems, we can take a backup that is consistent across nodes. So if I have a bunch of data, right, 
and there's live date, live updates coming in. Uh, it's a little difficult. Suppose it's a bank, right? Uh, it's a little hard to to decide at this moment in time. This was the state of of the world. And uh, what Mongo documents tell you to do is you just take a snapshot here, snapshot there, snapshot there. And if you go back to it, that might be a time that never existed, right? You took his, his time, like, timeline at, at early in the game and him in late in the game. And, you know, he's seen some changes and he hasn't seen it. They can be a big mess. So the way we do this is we send a bunch of tokens uh, at the same time or doesn't matter at the same. We send a bunch of tokens that say, this is part of a request to take a consistent snapshot. And uh, they, those tokens are sequenced across the role leaders. Everybody who gets them ends up uh, updating their, uh, their, uh, their files on disk. They go from one file to another. And the file that's left behind is essentially a copy on write file. And that file is, is essentially a consistent snapshot across the cluster. And so when you do a restore from that backup, you're going back to a very well-defined time. And, and I'm pretty proud of this feature. It's a 200 millisecond across the data center backup. Uh, it's, I don't know of anybody else who does anything close. It's kind of cool. OK. I'm, my voice is going away very slowly. So getting fast. Yeah. OK, shall we call it a night? Great. Thank you so much for coming by. Thanks. This is very good.